working. Hello and uh, good evening. Welcome to this talk on Tayari Jones's debut novel, Leaving Atlanta, with Tayari Jones, live from Atlanta. And uh, with me, Dominique Kenzel. I'm a literary scholar, writer, and editor-in-chief of Missy Magazine. And uh, this is our lovely speaker today, Katja Hutko. And um, let me introduce our guest of honor. Hello. <laughs> this is working. How wonderful. So, Tayari Jones was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1970. She studied at the University of Iowa and Arizona State University and started writing at Spelman College, which uh, is a HBCU, a historically black college, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that later. Um, and there she met author Pearl Clegg, who helped her publish her first story, Eugenics, in Catalyst magazine. Tayari Jones has written four novels, which have received numerous praise and awards. Leaving Atlanta, The Untelling, Silver Sparrow, and An American Marriage, the latter, which details the story of a young African-American couple whose life falls apart when the husband is arrested for a crime he did not commit, has enjoyed the greatest success to date. It was selected for Oprah Winfrey's Book Club in 2018 and won the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2019. Tayari Jones teaches at Emory University College of Arts and Sciences. And after several years in New York City, she now lives back in her hometown. So welcome. Good afternoon, Tayari. Um, how wonderful to have you here with us, um, ever so digitally. How are you today? I am doing well, except I am so sad not to be there with you. Well, I think this works fine. I'm actually quite impressed. Um, well, tonight we're going to talk about your debut novel, Leaving Atlanta, right, from 2002, uh, which you wrote while studying um, at Arizona State University and uh, which has now been published in German by Arche, uh, translated by Britt Soman Jung. And uh, the book explores the tragedy of the Atlanta child murders through the eyes of three fifth graders, um, three children, Latasha or Tasha, Rodney, and Octavia or Sweet Pea. And the book is divided into three parts and there are three perspectives. It is set during um, a school year or not even a term, perhaps only a term, right? Um, in 1979 in, um, of course, Atlanta. And I think it would be wonderful if you do us the honor to start with a short reading in English. Okay, um, thank you. I'm gonna read a short section from the point of view of Sweet Pea. She's a little girl. She lives with her mother and they live in a small apartment. And every night she looks to see if another child has been killed. If you keep in mind, in the 1970s, there was no Twitter, no Instagram. We had to wait until the evening news to find out what had happened in the day. And this is when she looks at the news and sees that one of her friends has been reported missing. It was a regular night. I was wrapped up like a mummy in my quilt with the TV turned to the 11 o'clock news. I had watched the six o'clock show with Mama, but I like to watch it again at 11 to make sure that everything is still okay. Channel two is the best channel because they got Monica Kaufman, a black lady, giving the report. As soon as the theme music went off and the camera zoomed in on Monica, I knew that somebody else was dead. Whenever there was bad news, she took a breath before she talked, like she was fixing to dive underwater. I held my breath too and waited for her to tell us who it was. Please, God, let it be far from here. I prayed right quick. But I should have known that praying only makes things worse. It gets God's attention, like with Job. Right there in the middle of the screen was my friend Rodney. Monica has this way of talking about everything like it was just a ribbon cut in downtown or something like that. She said, 
A 12th child has been reported missing in Southwest Atlanta tonight. Police are looking for information regarding the disappearance of Rodney Green. On and on like that. She said almost the same thing when Jashante next door came up missing. It would seem like there should be some different words to talk about two people that were nothing alike, but all Monica had to say about both of them was that they were gone. Then she showed Rodney's mother and father. They both just said how much they wanted him back, just like Miss Viola had said back in October. And even I was almost the same. I was on this same couch in my same pajamas, staring at this same TV like I had never seen one before. But last time, my mama was with me. We knew Jashante was missing because his mama had been all over the neighborhood looking for him. She knocked on our door twice. You seen Shanti, she said. I had the door locked because my mama wasn't home. No, ma'am, I hollered. She came back again, and I said no. Mama came home before Miss Viola came back again. Miss Viola had on a black skirt and a yellow and green top. Thick stockings, the color of white ladies, stretched up her legs and tied off at the knee. She sat down at our rickety table while Mama fixed her a cup of black coffee. When was the last time you seen him? Mama asked her. When he went off for school this morning. Mama looked at the clock. It was nine o'clock at night. She had only been looking for him since eight. I sat as quiet as I could so I wouldn't get sent to my room. You gonna call the police now? You think I should? Yeah, Mama said. They can help you look. But I got some hot checks at Big Star, some other places around town. Her voice faded out. Sometimes the police pick people up for stuff like that. Viola, Mama said. This ain't no time to be worried about no bad checks. This is your baby. You're right, Miss Viola said. She pushed up on the table to get up. Wait a second. Mama put another cup in front of her. You better get another cup of coffee in you before you go talking to the police. Now, why she needed to have coffee before she talked to the police, I don't know. She didn't look to me like she was about to fall asleep. Maybe coffee makes you brave. Granny says that it puts hair on your chest, but mama doesn't let me touch it because she believes it'll stop my growth. So when they put Jashante on the 11 o'clock news, I was ready, but this Rodney thing caught me by surprise like a cheap trick. Then they put a big clock on the screen. It's 11.15, do you know where your children are? Mama knew where I was, and I knew that she was at the Sunbeam factory making bread and imitation Twinkies, but knowing don't mean nothing if you can't be there. And besides, by the time a mama can figure out that she doesn't know where her child is, it's all over with anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Tayari, I think we have to uh, do some groundwork here first because I'm, I'm fairly sure that not many people here are familiar with that event, the Atlanta child murders. Um, could you give us some historical context? Yes, I'm happy to. And I have to say that when I wrote this book, many people here in the U.S. did not know about this event. In 1979 through 1981, about 28 black children were murdered in the city of Atlanta. It was, imagine, it was 1979, so this is 10 years after the death of Martin Luther King. I think people thought that we had passed this idea of domestic terror against, against black people. And almost all the children murdered were boys, except for two girls. And two of the students were students at my school. In 1981, they did arrest someone for the crime, but the city was divided. It seemed like it was a tale of two cities, that black people did not believe that Wayne Williams, a black man, had done it. Mm -hmm. And it seemed that the white people in Atlanta felt relieved that a black man had been arrested because then they could say, this wasn't racism, it was just depravity. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, almost all the children who were killed were poor. So regardless of who killed them, it was the systemic racism that caused these poor children to be you know, unsupervised because their mothers were working, because they were little children who were you know, selling candy to strangers in order to make money. So even if it wasn't 
a hate crime per se. I -hmm. believe that it was motivated by the racism in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were particularly vulnerable. Um, I think what's also is uh, important is um, is that we need to talk about Atlanta. Um, I hope, but I, I'm not quite sure that a German audience is familiar with what this city stands for. You know, a city that is also called a, a black mecca, um, where you have a very confident and ubiquitous um, black middle class and an amazing cultural scene. Um, I've personally been to Atlanta once uh, in 2016, and you know it was a revelation. I, I mean, it's just the people, the food, uh, the fact that I was handed natural hair product samples on the street. You know, it's um, just that ease of black life, of black normalcy. I think this is very special. And um, please, Sayari, could you tell us a little bit more about Atlanta? Well, first, if you ever come back to Atlanta, I have to give you a party, so that's oh, one thing. That, w that would be amazing. <laughs> but more importantly, Atlanta, particularly in 1979, it was the only city in America that had a black mayor, black school board president, black police chief, as my father would say, black everything. Mm -hmm. We have four historically black colleges there. And so this was seen to be the promised land. Like my father migrated to Atlanta from a small town because of the opportunity. So you could just imagine the slap in the face it was to this city for there to be an epidemic of murdered black children in this town. Mm -hmm. And it created a, quite a conflict because, you know, in America, everything is race, race, race. But at that moment in Atlanta, class became the issue at the forefront. Because if the mayor is black mm -hmm. and the police chief is black and the children are black, then everyone was saying, why isn't more being done if everyone is black? Mm -hmm. And the question became, because some people were poor and some people were not. Mm. Interesting. Um, just a, a side question is, wh why did you leave, or what made you leave for New York, and uh, why did you come back? Well, I went to New York because publishing lives in New York, and it mm -hmm. seems that most like when I was living in New York, I could go to a coffee shop and all of America's most famous writers are all drinking coffee in the same coffee shop. <laughs> I don't think it's safe for us to have it so concentrated, but more importantly, it occurred to me that even though these writers come from all over the country and many of them from other places in the world, if we are all drinking the same coffee, at some point our writing is going to become the same. Mm. Because we're all have this, like this Monday morning, we would all be having the same experience. They have run out of croissant at this coffee shop. So we have a shared mm. disappointment. And I want to bring back the literature of different parts of the country uniquely representing those different cultures. Mm -hmm. The US is such yes. a large country that the culture, the landscape, everything is different from place to place. So we have to go back to our hometowns so that we will not all start writing the same story. Mm, yeah, I see that. Um, well, let's get to the book. Um, so the German title for Leaving Atlanta is uh, Das Jahr, in dem wir verschwanden, uh, which translates into the year in which we disappeared. And I'm actually quite interested in that we, because um, so technically only one of the children leaves Atlanta in the common sense of the word and only at the very end of the book um, when Octavia is sent to live with her father in um, South Carolina. Um, but of course the children who are murdered are also leaving um, in a way. And in that sense I think that the uh, we in the German title is is a bit spooky even. Um, can you tell us more about your thoughts behind the title, Leaving Atlanta? And do you think the German translation actually captures this sense of dread that is very much at the heart of the story? I chose the title, Leaving Atlanta, because yes, the character leaves at the end. But also I was thinking of Atlanta in the sense of the idea of this post-civil rights you know, utopia, mm -hmm. that that's over, that it shattered the myth of Atlanta as well. And after the child murders, we all had to leave. It's like, leave, you know, east of Eden. We had to leave this dream that our, our parents had this dream because we as children, the thing about children is that 
other people view children symbolically. They say children mm -hmm. are the future. They are the culmination of our parents' sacrifice. But children do not understand themselves as symbols. When you're a child, you think you're just a child. Mm -hmm. you, know, you are unaware that you are the future. So the title, Leaving Atlanta, was really more about the experience of the collective community. Mm -hmm. But I think the year we all disappeared, it's also an excellent title because that was a year, it was really two years that we lived in terror mm -hmm. as children. And also, one thing that struck me when I was writing this book, I wrote the book not because I felt that the world, America, had forgotten these children, but I was very curious as to why we, who experienced this, never spoke of it again. It's mm -hmm. though we promised ourselves that we would not talk about this so that we could move forward, but we had this hidden pain that we, we needed to talk about. So there I was, you know, I was about 30 years old when I wrote this book, to bring up a long buried childhood pain. Mm. Yeah, this story, I mean, it, it's haunting, and, and I understand that it haunted you um, in a way, and you wrote it when you were, yeah, as you said, um, early 30s um, or late 20s. I guess it captures your coming of age as well. Mm, how close do you, do you feel to these kids? I mean, and how do you look at them now? I look at this book almost like looking through an old photo album, mm -hmm. and that's what's the experience also of writing it. It was very important to me that I capture the trauma of the child murders, but also that I capture the pleasure and absurdity mm -hmm. of childhood. You know, childhood is a predicament for everyone. And I wanted to capture that because when I was working on this book, um, someone said to me, oh my goodness, you must not have had a childhood. Mm -hmm. And to say that is to compromise my humanity. Yes, all children are having a childhood. We just had a childhood that intersected with this trauma, but we still had all of the small, petty concerns that other children have. I will always think of myself as a very young person doing my, for, this is a strange example, but when I was a little girl, I had to go get fitted for this little small mm -hmm. bra. Mm -hmm. And oh, the, the training I, bra? The training bra, yes. I, and it was a little premature, but my other friends had one and I must get one. So my mother took me to the store and the woman measuring me was kind of smirking because I was so tiny. And I remember that I was upset because I didn't think she was taking me and my budding puberty seriously. Mm -hmm. And I looked over her shoulder and there was a television and they announced that one of the children that I knew from school had been murdered. Mm -hmm. And okay. I will always think of those two things together. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't want to separate those. So before I looked and saw the murdered person, it was an, a story that I would have told as an adult in an amusing way. Yeah. And, and it's, so I said, it still is amusing, but then it's not. But I wanted to have both because the range of experience is what makes it human. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually wanted to talk more about these fabulous kids. I think you really captured their voices and their perspective so perfectly. I mean, you know, I really want to kind of reach out and hug them and, or, you know, in the case of Rodney, maybe protect them and all of them really, because I think very true to the genre of coming of age, they all kind of experience this pain of coming of age um, in some form or another. Um, so I wanted to talk about these kids individually and uh, I wanted to begin with Octavia. So her family and uh, friends call her Sweet Pea. The kids at school call her Watusi because she, quote unquote, looks like a black African. Um, she's comparably poor, and there are also hints about sexual abuse, I think, from a male relative. Um, maybe I think this is a good um, point for our speaker, Katya, to continue with a section on Octavia. Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> Ich nahm den Telefonhörer ab und hielt ihn ans Ohr. Erst kam ich mir blöd vor, wegen des Freizeichens. Aber gleichzeitig ging es mir besser. Besser, weil Ray nicht immer noch irgendwie in der Leitung war und darauf lauschte, wie ich zu denken versuchte. Blöd. Jeder Idiot weiß ja, dass Telefone so nicht funktionieren. Aber 
Warum hatte Ray überhaupt hier angerufen? Ich hatte nicht Geburtstag und er hatte auch nicht nach mir gefragt. Er wollte Mama sprechen. Ich fragte mich, warum. Vielleicht kamen sie wieder zusammen, wie in dem alten Film The Parent Trap. Ich kann mich aber gar nicht daran erinnern, dass sie irgendwann mal zusammen waren. Sie sind nicht geschieden. Außerdem hat er eine Ehefrau, Gloria, gute Qualität. Naja, und eine andere Tochter hat er auch. Ähm, aber das heißt nicht, dass er nicht immer noch mein Daddy ist. Die Ehefrau von guter Qualität bedeutet sicher, wow, <lacht> gute Qualität, okay. So. Die Ehefrau von guter Qualität bedeutet sicher, dass die neue Tochter Kiana auch gute Qualität war. Ich fragte mich, ob man halb gute Qualität sein konnte, wie Patrick Fletcher aus meiner Klasse, der halb weiß ist, was aber das Gleiche ist, wie schwarz zu sein. Er hat nur hellere Haut. Bin ich also auch von guter Qualität oder funktioniert es genau andersrum? Ich ging ins Bad und betrachtete mich im Spiegel. Nach guter Qualität sah ich nicht aus. Warum musste ich so schiefe Zähne haben? Mama hat ein schönes Lächeln und Trace Zähne sind vielleicht klein, aber haben große Zwischenräume, aber sie sind gerade. Und dann mein Haar. Selbst wenn Mama mir erlauben würde, es glätten zu lassen, müsste man noch viel Arbeit reinstecken, bevor man von guter Qualität sprechen konnte. Irgendwas war im Busch. Und ich brauchte Zeit, um darüber nachzudenken. Zu Hause ging das nicht, weil da das Telefon war und ich immer drauf starren musste, weil Ray jeden Moment anrufen konnte. Er hatte schon dreimal diese Woche angerufen. Normalerweise bringt er es auf dreimal im Jahr. Einmal an Weihnachten, einmal an meinem Geburtstag und einmal, nachdem Mama mehr Geld von ihm gefordert hat. Das eine Mal war ich ans Telefon gegangen, die anderen beiden Male Mama. Sie versuchte sich nichts anmerken zu lassen, aber ich wusste, wer dran war. Ich musste irgendwo anders hin. Naja, aber wenn man kein Auto und keine Kohle hat, kann man nicht wählerisch sein. Ich entschied mich für den Park neben unserer Kirche, Flippertempel. Da hätte ich meine Ruhe, weil da kaum noch Kinder rumhingen, seitdem immer wieder welche verschwanden. Von der Schule zum Park war es gar nicht so weit. Aber als ich oben auf dem steilen Hügel ankam, war ich ganz schön aus der Puste. Ich setzte mich auf die harte Plastikschaukel, um mich auszuruhen. Trotz der Handschuhe konnte ich spüren, wie kalt die Ketten waren. In meiner Tasche hatte ich einen frisch angespitzten Bleistift, den ich jedem ins Auge rammen konnte, der versuchte, der versuchen sollte, mich zu verschleppen. Ich bewegte die Beine vor und zurück, um die Schaukel in Schwung zu bringen. Aber ich war zu groß für dieses Babymodell. Meine Füße schleiften über den Boden und ich musste die Beine stark anwinkeln. Dann schaukelte ich hin und her wie ein Baby in der Wiege. Als ich noch klein war und Onkel Kenny noch bei uns wohnte, ist er oft mit mir in diesen Park gegangen. Manchmal sind wir zum Burger King auf der anderen Straßenseite rüber und haben uns einen Milchshake mit zwei Strohhalmen geholt. Ich wünschte, er wäre wieder so wie früher und jetzt hier bei mir. Ich holte mit den Beinen Schwung. Die trockene, kalte Luft machte mir trockene Augen aber ich vermied zu blinzeln. Ich sah zu, wie alles klein wurde, dann wieder groß. Ich schaukelte so hoch, dass die Ketten jedes Mal einen kleinen Satz machten, bevor es wieder abwärts ging. Ein paar Leute, die vorbeikamen, sahen sich nach mir um. Sie fragten sich wohl, wer das große Mädchen war, das auf einer Babyschaukel schaukelte, als würde es damit irgendwo hinkommen. Thank you. I think for me, Octavia is the strongest figure in the book. Um, and, and she's also the one who's going on a physical journey, you know, even though the ending is very bittersweet, like grapes. Um, but let's move on to uh, Rodney. Uh, so his story is so heartbreaking, you know, um, throughout, even though, I mean, there are glimpses of hope, uh, his burgeoning friendship uh, with Octavia is really, really sweet. And, and, you know, he is a really, he's a whip-smart little kid. You know, I, I love his diction. 
Um, the way you did that is amazing. And um, But I'm particularly interested in the very complicated relationship he has with his father. Um, because from reading An American Marriage, um, I got the sense that your books, um, you know, among many other things, are also um, explorations of black masculinity, uh, you know, gender in general. But I think I would like to talk about that father figure, you know, this kind of uh, tough love approach and the notion of having to do one's duty. Mm. I was also struck how similar the fathers uh, in An American Marriage acted towards Roy and Celeste. Um, and there's this actually this particular scene where Rodney's mother, and I actually pictured her a little bit like uh, uh, someone from Real Housewives of Atlanta, <laughs> I don't know if that was accurate, um, but she tries to explain Rodney's mediocre grades with the fact that he is not challenged by the schoolwork, and then his dad launches into a speech about picking cotton, right? And I understand that this is something your father said to you as well. Yes, I was really, I am very interested in masculinity and the way that it's handed down generationally and how much, how imposed masculinity must be. Rodney is a sensitive boy and he doesn't, his father, you know, is a laborer, his father works with his hands and he has this kind of delicate bookish child and he doesn't know how to relate to his son. He's much better with his daughter because mm -hmm. he understands his daughter to be kind of a princess to put on a shelf. And that's not a very complicated, putting a child on the shelf is not a complicated thing to do. But he's trying to force Rodney to conform to his ideas you know, of masculinity. And that ultimately causes him to lose his son. But I didn't, but I understood, I understood the father. That's all he's ever known. And this is something that in mm -hmm. all my books, I look at this way is that people in an effort to do the best they can, do the worst thing that they can do. I mean, he beats his son in front of the class. And this is something when I was growing up, people would do. Like if you had a very poorly behaved child, the teacher may call the mother or the father, usually the mother, and she would come and whip the child in front of the whole class and humiliate mm -hmm. them. And this, you know, this happens to Rodney and it breaks his spirit. Now, the matter of picking cotton. <laughs> My daddy picked cotton when he was a boy. My mm -hmm. father is a PhD in political science. <laughs> So he hasn't seen any cotton in many, many years. But that is a memory of him because I think that's also a kind of generational trauma mm -hmm. passed down. Mm -hmm. And when I wanted to go to get a degree in creative writing, my father said, you know what your problem is? He said, you never had to pick cotton. And I indicated that for me, this was not a problem per se. Mm -hmm. But he said, when you pick cotton, you don't say, this is not my niche. You don't say, this cotton does not respect my creativity. You don't say, I am unable to flourish amid this cotton. He said, you just pick the damn cotton. And I was really frustrated because I knew what he meant, but at the same time, I wanted more than, I wanted to be affirmed by my work. But he saw it as me throwing his sacrifice back in his face. But then I... Finally, after a really like a three-day standoff that was not cute mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. I explained to him that the fact that I wanted to be creative, the fact that I wanted to do work that nurtured my spirit, this was not rejection of the sacrifice. It was mm -hmm. the reward of the sacrifice. Yes. Mm, powerful. So, yeah, finally, we have Tasha. Um, and her story actually opens the book. And like Rodney, Tasha is relatively well off, uh, black middle class. I mean, she struggles to understand the relationship, um, her parents' relationship troubles. But um, on the other hand, she's like deeply, deeply self-involved, you know, as preteens are. And she wants to be popular, uh, not realizing that the most popular girls in her class are actually mean girls who end up bullying her. Um, and that struck me as very timeless. But uh, what drew you to her perspective, Tasha's perspective? I have to say it hurts my feelings when people say she's self-involved because I was exactly like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the same. I mean, that's <laughs> puberty, you know? <laughs> I, I, she has a life most like mine. Like, many of the things that happened to her mm -hmm. happened to me. Yeah. Like, my mother was in charge of the PTA, the, the Parent Association, and I was invited to a party, and the party didn't have adequate supervision. 
and my mother called all the other mothers. Oh and the God! Party was canceled. I oh felt no. like keep. That I was you. Her, <laughs> oh God. I felt like keep me home. Don't ruin it. And then I was outcast. Mm -hmm. Of course, as an adult, I understand how my mother could not. In in that climate, yes, one hundred percent. Yes, and the other mothers were her friends. I didn't understand that mothers had friends. I don't know what I thought mothers did, but of course she had to call her friends. Mm -hmm. So I was a lot like her, and I wanted to be popular, and I wanted a pink coat, and mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I captured just to capture a black child doing something other than busy being busy being black. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, when I, I was a child, yeah. I didn't wake up being like, I'm black, what will I do today? Mm -hmm. I didn't think yes. like that. I really, really loved the ice rink scene. I think that was just so, I mean, for me, that was so universal preteen, teen experience. I love that. And maybe we can hear our next um, passage, which is actually um, on Tasha. Mm -hmm. Die Luft in der Küche war äußerst gespannt, wie ein Gummiband. Daddy stützte seine Ellenbogen auf den Tisch und bedeckte die Augen mit den Handballen. Plötzlich sehnte Tascha sich danach, dass er sie auf den Schoß nahm, auf die Stirn küsste und ihr sagte, dass alles gut werden würde. Aber er sah sie nicht einmal an. Er schien in seine Handflächen zu starren, wie jemand, der in einem Versteckspiel gefangen war. Mama schickte die Mädchen in ihr Zimmer, ohne dass er die sich rührte. Tascha blieb im schummrigen Flur stehen, wartete. Da war noch mehr. Daddys Gesicht wirkte auf eine Weise belastet, die Tascha bekannt vorkam. Tascha, flüsterte Deshaun. Sie hatte vergessen, dass ihre kleine Schwester bei ihr war. Psst, machte sie sanft. Deshaun schob, Deshaun schob, schob sich so dicht an Tascha heran, dass sie den Cool-Aid-Atem ihrer kleinen Schwester riechen konnte, während sie ihre Eltern beobachtete. Und Dolores sagte Daddy kläglich, komm her sagte Mama, ohne sich zu rühren. Daddy stand langsam auf, machte vorsichtige Schritte, als täten ihm die Füße weh und blieb vor Mamas Stuhl stehen. Sie strich sich den Rock über dem Schoß glatt und er sank langsam nieder, setzte die Knie behutsam auf das gelbe Linoleum. Ihre Gesichter waren auf der gleichen Höhe. Sch, sagte Mama. Sie nahm sein Gesicht in die Hände, ihre Nägel hoben sich sauber und weiß von seiner Haut ab. Sag nicht Sch flehte er. Ich muss reden. Er legte den Kopf in ihren Schoß, als wäre er furchtbar müde. In sanften Kreisen rieb sie die Geschichte aus seinem Kopf. Da, wo wir hin sind, war es wie da, wo ich aufgewachsen bin. <lacht> Echt verrückt. 25 Meilen aus Atlanta raus und bam, wieder in Alabama. <lacht> er gab ein Laut von sich, der entfernt an ein Lachen erinnerte. Weiße, die dich teils fies, teils verängstigt ansehen. Die, die gekommen waren, um uns zu helfen, sahen anständig aus, das gebe ich zu. Aber die meisten haben keinen Finger gerührt, sind einfach in ihre Häuser geblieben. Sie haben uns in Paare eingeteilt. Ich wurde mit einem weißen Typen zusammengesteckt, John oder Jim, ich weiß nicht mehr. Wir haben kein Wort geredet, was wahrscheinlich das Beste war. Mir fällt nichts ein, was er hätte sagen können, ohne dass ich ihm am liebsten eine reingehauen hätte. Ich glaube, das hat er mir angemerkt. Die anständigen Weißen verstehen manchmal, dass wir ihnen nicht verzeihen können. Vor allem nicht in Zeiten wie diesen. Im Flur fragte Tascha sich, was mit ihr selbst war. Mit Daddy, sogar mit Monica und Virginia. Konnte ihnen allen verziehen werden? Vielleicht nicht in Zeiten wie diesen, aber... Irgendwann mal? Ich und Jim waren also im Wald und haben mit unseren Stöcken Laubhaufen umgepflügt. Es war kühl und trocken, aber die Blätter unten drunter waren feucht und verklebt. Modrig, eklig. Ich wollte die ganze Zeit nur nach Hause. Ich wäre sogar lieber auf einen dieser verdammten Jacksterne getreten, die Tasche immer überall rumliegen lässt. Aber ich musste weitersuchen, verstehst du? Ich sehe fern und ich sehe Eltern bei der Beerdigung ihrer Kinder. Also muss ich weitersuchen, ich muss helfen. Wie kann ich sagen, dass ich es nicht ertrage, unter einen Haufen durchweichter Blätter zu gucken, wenn ich doch weiß, dass es ganz so schrecklich nicht werden kann, weil meine Mädchen zu Hause im Bett liegen? War es Deschante? Tascha konnte 
ihn sich nur so vorstellen, wie sie ihn auf dem Foto in den Nachrichten gesehen hatte. Sie sah ihn verschwommen, unscharf, stranguliert in einem Müllsack. Sch sagte Mama, ich weiß, du musst nicht darüber reden. Sie wiegte ihn wie ein quengliges Baby. Mama, lass ihn reden, flüsterte Tascha. Nur Worte konnten Worte und Geschehen machen. Um etwas zurückzunehmen, musste man es rückwärts sagen. So hieß es jedenfalls unter Kindern. Stirbst du, hoffe ich. 18 als wird älter. Sei nett nicht einfach. Man kann Leuten machen zu. Genau darum geht es mir doch. Wie kann ich sagen, dass ich es nicht ertrage, darüber zu reden? Und wie kannst du sagen, dass du es nicht erträgst, davon zu hören, wenn andere Menschen es erleben müssen? Tascha konnte das Gesicht ihres Vaters nicht sehen. Sie hörte die seltsame, erstickende Stimme und einen Moment lang konnte sie nicht glauben, dass er es war. Sie musste sehen, wie sein Mund die Worte formte. Ich habe die Blätter umgedreht, fuhr Daddy fort. Ich habe mich geschämt, verstehst du? Und gleichzeitig habe ich... Gott gedankt, wenn da nichts außer Würmer und Erde war. Dann sind wir auf etwas Stinkendes in einem Müllsack gestoßen. Mama rieb seinen Hals, bis die Wörter kamen. Der Sack hatte ungefähr die richtige Größe. Und da war irgendwas Totes drin, das wusste ich. Nichts anderes riecht so. Ich wollte den Sack in Ruhe lassen. Oder einen der Gruppenführer rufen, damit der sich drum kümmert. Aber dieser weiße Bursche hat mich angeguckt, das habe ich gespürt. Ich habe also meinen Stock genommen und den Sack aufgestochen. Es war nur ein toter Hund. War das alles, was du gefunden hast? Mamas Stimme war so ruhig, als hätte sie gesagt, halt still, bevor sie einem das Pflaster abriss. Was gab es da draußen zu sehen? Hübsche Umschläge. Rote Erde, rosa Satin, glänzende zehn cent und M&Ms. Ein Purpurherz aufgerissen. Ich? fragte Daddy. Ja, mehr habe ich nicht gesehen. Aber die andere Gruppe, die ist auf ein kleines Mädchen gestoßen. Gott, sagte Mama, wo? Das ist es ja, sagte Daddy. Es war hier in der Nähe. Das war mir erst nicht klar. Es sprach sich rum, dass sie eine Leiche gefunden hatten, eigentlich ein Skelett bei einem See. Hier in der Nähe, fragte Mama. Ihre Hand stellte die beruhigenden Kreise ein. Ich bin einem Polizisten begegnet, einem Bruder. Er meinte, sie hätten sie im Nesky Lake gefunden. Ich habe gefragt, wo zum Teufel ist das? Und er hat es mir erklärt. Ich habe gesagt, Mann, das ist nicht weit von da, wo ich wohne. Ich habe noch nie von einem See bei der Cascade Road gehört. Und er so, jemand anders schon. Dann blieben sie still. Die Heizung brummte vor sich hin, während ihr Vater mit dem Kopf im Schoß ihrer Mutter dort kniete. Tascha zog an Deschamps Hand und sie huschten leise in die schwarze Dunkelheit ihres Zimmers. Tascha drückte das Gesicht ans Fenster und sah durch das Stutzgitter in die finstere Nacht. Sie blickte über den Rasen. Es war zu dunkel, um die kahlen Bäume zu erkennen, aber sie wusste, dass sie da waren. Er schandte war auch da draußen, aber die Nacht war gewaltig. Sie sah nur einen Stern. Tascha schloss die Augen, aber wünschte sich nichts. Tascha, sagte Deschamps schläfrig, was ist das Zauberwort? Hm, sagte Tascha zerstreut. Du hast gesagt, es gibt ein Zauberwort, dann ist man in Sicherheit. Ach, das Zauberwort, sagte Tascha, als gibt's nur das eine. Worte konnten magisch sein, aber nicht auf Abracadabra-Art, wie Sean glaubte. Die Magie, die von Lippen ausging, konnte so grausam sein wie Kinder und so unberechenbar wie ein Gummiball, der von Beton abprallte. Sean, sagte Tascha, es gibt kein Zauberwort. Gar keins? Nicht so wie du glaubst. Oh, sagte Deschamps mit fast greifbarer Enttäuschung. Naja, erklärte Tascha, es gibt eine Macht, aber sie brach ab. Sie wollte ihre Schwester mit mehr als dürftigen, unkontrollierbaren Wörtern trösten. Aber was? 
Bordete schauen. Es gibt kein Wort. Es ist etwas mit Zauberkraft. Tascha holte ihr Schantis Duftbaum aus ihrem Kissenbezug. Sie drückte ihn an ihre Lippen und wurde von seinem grünen Duft überwältigt, bevor sie ihn ihrer Schwester reichte. Leg den unter dein Kissen, dann passiert dir nichts. Im Herbst werfen die Eichen ihre Früchte auf Atlantas Grasflächen und Gärten und bedecken sie mit einem Flickenteppich aus welkem Laub. Latasha Renee Baxter hielt ihre kleine Schwester an der Hand, als sie nach der Schule über den Rasen ging und die Eicheln unter ihren Füßen in rote Erde drückten. Die Luft stank nach Laub, das in Metallfässern brannte. Aber Tascha musste an das. Aber Tascha musste an den reinen, frischen Duft von Kiefern denken. Thank you. So um, in this passage we also have this uh, very, very powerful scene. Um, where Tasha's father airs his despair and you know his pain after going on a search party to f find bodies, um, their children's bodies. Um, it's been shortened a little bit, but he also um, he he notes Emmett Till uh, and the Birmingham church bombing, and and he feels like nothing has changed. That racism is rampant and killing their children. Um, and there is really a sense of timelessness um, to his message that feels very uncanny, um, especially because that entire part on Tasha, Tasha is really obsessed with the fact uh, that the children, the murdered children are asphyxiated, um, so they're smothered. Um, so she imagines and sometimes she even feels like she quote unquote can't breathe. Um, so Tayari, how do you feel about the way that this resonates now um, 20 years later? You know, I'm struck by this feeling of things have not changed, particularly, you know, with the political climate here. And I look at my own father, who, when I was a child, he did pretty much all the able-bodied men went on these search parties to look for the children's bodies. It was kind of like his civic duty to do so. And so that was based on a real experience. But I look now, my father is now um, 84 years old. And he made so many sacrifices during the civil rights movement, only to see you know, voting rights roll back, only to mm -hmm. see the police killings. And it kills me to mm -hmm. see the despair after the unbelievable um, optimism of Obama, yes. right? When, like when old people died during the Obama years, we would say, I'm so glad you know, she lived long enough to see Obama. Mm -hmm. And then when people died during Trump, it was so sad to say, oh, no. I hate, you know, I hate that this was the last thing she knew after all the sacrifices she made. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it's the same sense of that the progress is so easily taken away, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that was happening then and it's happening again now. But I think also important is that we realize that racism endures, but resistance endures as well. And mm -hmm. to remember that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, throughout the book, I also love the theme of magical words and of the power of speaking. You know, it's there in all three parts. Like um, Tasha, we, we heard that just now. She is scared that she jinxed Jashante um, when he disappears. And there's Octavia. She's quite occupied with the fact that her mother lies. And, you know, she's obsessed with telling the truth in general. And then there's a scene where Rodney um, notices how nobody... Um, in their class can speak about the missing children in their midst because, as he says, words are unreliable. Um, and in this scene that we just heard where Tasha's father voices his pain and then his wife shushes him, um, Tasha says, you know, let daddy speak. Only words can undo words. Um, and I found that quite beautiful. So words are unreliable, but they're also the antidote, you know. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how does this connect to uh, what you do as a writer um, with words? And how do you see your role as an artist in, in voicing, in speaking about injustice? I do believe that words, words can heal, words can wound. And it does take words to undo the wounding of words. Um, I think I realized that as a child, like Tasha, as a child, I had this incredible sense of importance. And I did believe that I could say things, that I could speak things into existence. I remember mm -hmm. 
when the child murders happened. I, I, there was a boy in our class who had, was killed, and he was, like Jashante, he was a little older than us. I looked at his picture, though. He was such a little boy. I was nine. He was 12. Mm -hmm. So he seemed to be in a different category of person. But I didn't like him. He, was, he terrorized the little kids. And when he died, I did feel responsible. And I remember I went to the school counselor who said, what makes you think you have that kind of power? <laughs> and I was relieved and offended at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. as, a, as a writer, I sometimes, I do feel that the, the written word in our work as writers unsettles and shines light. But at the same time, I'm sometimes frustrated. Like during Black Lives Matter, I couldn't write fiction because I felt like, what am I doing? I'm just here mm -hmm. playing with my imaginary friends while these young people are in the streets. Mm -hmm. And I felt the limits also of art. And I feel like I struggle with that all the time. And the only way that I could get myself to write this summer or last summer was to send a check to the funds to get the mm -hmm. kids out of jail. And mm -hmm. once I had sent money, I felt like every time I got a kid out of jail, I was then allowed to spend some time on my, on my own work. Mm. Oh, interesting. Um, so I think those murders, um, especially because they never quite have been solved, um, for me they seem to be just one example of how black history is not only forgotten, you know, but actually repressed and sometimes, you know, as you said, by, by the communities themselves. And I'm also thinking about the Tulsa massacre, um, you know, which is now being dealt with a lot more extensively. Um, do you think that today we are actually, um, we have better tools or we are better equipped to grapple with these kinds of traumas? Or is it just um, a matter of um, media or mainstream attention? I think that we are better able to show the trauma, but I don't think that we are better able to do the heavy emotional work of mm -hmm. unraveling that trauma. Like we are searching for justice, but what we don't know what that would look like. Um, like when I think about these child murders, the thing that never happened that I would have needed, and I probably still need, I'm 50 years old now, but I think I can still, I still have experiences every now and then that remind me of the fact that that sense of safety was never returned. Mm -hmm. And that is what we have to actually grapple with. That is what will allow us to find a way forward. You know, punishing the guilty, that's great, but that is not, you know, the restorative justice that we need. Mm -hmm. There was a group of women during the child murders. They had a, an organization called the Committee to Stop the Children's Murders. And they were um, working class women whose children were the most vulnerable. And the, their demands were the things that all children need. They wanted after school activities. They wanted um, places where their children could get healthy lunch, healthy breakfast, just the things that people need to live whole lives. And when people are living whole lives, we will be able to better address these traumas as whole people. Mm. Yeah, um, that connects actually to um, my next point. So your, your name, Tayari, um, is Swahili for ready, prepared. Is that right? This yeah. is true. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and from your acknowledgments, I gather that you also have a, a brother called Patrice Lumumba, um, you know, after the famous Congolese independence leader who was murdered in, in 1961. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, it seems like your parents clearly made sure you knew your black history, you know, they instilled a sense of Pan-African pride in you. Um, how has this shaped you? It's an interesting thing. So when I was coming of age in the 70s, there were a lot of children with parents like these. Like my brother is Lumumba, the little boy who um, sat next to me in class. His name was Fanon. Mm -hmm. And there was another boy named Lumumba, so we had to call him the <laughs> other Lumumba. Wow. I wasn't aware of how unusual this was. I think I grew up with a very strong sense of black, of black male history. Ah, uh, yes. Good point. And I think, though, that this made it where it was much easier for me to embrace feminism because I didn't have to feel like, because this understanding of black history and black resistance was so taken for granted, it didn't seem like this fragile edifice that would be torn down by feminism. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Spelman College, which is a historically black college for women. And it was there at Spelman that for the first time in my life, I heard the word gender outside of my Latin class. Mm -hmm. And when I learned that, everything made sense to me. 
Because like, look at me, I'm named Tayari, which means ready or prepared, but I never knew any girls that were the namesakes of heroes, like my brother Lumumba, like my friend Fanon, mm -hmm. like the millions of boys named Malcolm. I mm -hmm. never knew a woman whose legacy was considered significant enough to be carried on in the naming. Mm, yeah, that's that's a really, I think, interesting and important difference. Um, and I also tend to remind people that, you know, Black Lives Matter was founded by three women, you know, and there is change in that sense, you know, uh, an important intervention. Um, yes, it was founded, founded by three women, yet so much of the focus of the movement is on, still, on the lives of men. Still, yeah. Still, except that's where it gets forgotten, you know. But it's, I think it's very important um, to keep on to that um, and look at how things have changed in a way that is actually progressive. Um, but going back to your childhood and also how you work this in into the novel, I mean, yeah, there are also the two kids. And as you just said, one is called Fanon uh, Robinson, the other is called Malcolm Smith. Uh, and they, um, they are shown to not take the pledge and they are kind of exempt through letters by their parents, They're saying that they don't believe in the flag. Uh, and later, I found that quite uh, funny. They are um, tired of being so different, and they start taking the pledge. And I, I wondered, is this something that you, uh, you experience as something you can relate to? Yeah, well, here's the thing. Children, parenthood is inherently a performance. And so part of our parents' demonstration of their beliefs were in the way that their children behaved at school. And at some point at a kid, as a child, you feel like everyone's saying the pledge, we're not saying the pledge. And I felt like my father, no one ever asked him to say the pledge, so he didn't have to be different, because mm -hmm. he's not a child. And at some point I decided I was going to say the pledge, I just wanted it to be like other children. That's what children I, want the most, yeah. And, but I do appreciate it, or even having this name. Like I used to hate for anyone to ask me my name because I would have to spell it and explain it. But then when I went to university and everyone was adopting African names, yes, you know, so I you had a head start one. there, yeah. And that was that Definitely. was important. But it's difficult having counterculture parents. Yeah, I, I would about my name. I would always say my parents didn't change their names. No, mm -hmm. they gave me this name, and I was I felt like a little bit of a proxy. But I will tell this very brief story of what I most appreciate about this childhood. We were boycotting certain companies because they supported apartheid. And I was very serious about it as a girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was with a friend and the mother was filling the gas, the car with gas from a station that we were boycotting. And I said to her, excuse me, we don't use this gas because they support apartheid and they kill children. <laughs> and the wow. woman blew me off because she didn't talk to children as whole people, and she filled the gas, and I refused to go, and I forfeited the outing to the zoo, and my parents had to come get me, and my dad picked me up. I was Aww. just crying, and he said, I am so proud of you, and I still remember that as the most mm. affirming thing yes, that had ever happened. It's so principled, and you, and you knew what it meant to stand for something, which is a great experience. I also heard that you, you, know, you weren't allowed to drink Coca-Cola, which is, you know, in Atlanta, is intense. No, because they supported intense, apartheid. You know? they, yeah. I would always say, they kill children. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, I want to talk more a little bit uh, before we close, and maybe we can have some audience questions. Let's see um, about the fact that this is, you know, that is like a um, this novel has now been republished, and but I understand that this is not your debut. Actually, well, it is your debut, but it's not your first novel. Um, do you want to talk about the one that you wrote before, then that you have described as uh, terrible, or is that, that like banished from your memory? Yeah. So, could you talk I mean, about it, or maybe you can just. <laughs> The most important thing about that terrible novel is that it was meaningful to me because I finished it. Exactly. I tell anyone who wants to write, just get it finished. Because once I wrote that bad novel, it was really bad, <laughs> but I felt like, okay, I wrote this, it's not good, but I will write another one and it will be better. And if it's not good enough, I can write another one. Just, mm -hmm. You just try and keep going until mm -hmm. you get better and you will. Anyone who wants to write, that is my message to you. Just keep at it. It will get there. Mm, beautiful. What gave you the courage to continue? You know what's really funny? I think I got the courage to continue because 
I did not feel that my work was terribly important. So mm -hmm. I did not have pressure on myself. I had mm -hmm. the pleasure I took from the writing, but I didn't think anyone was looking over my shoulder or judging me. This was the strange way that I think sexism worked on my behalf. As mm -hmm. a girl, as a girl child in my family, I was not taken seriously, so I was mm. not pressured. You were under the radar, yeah. I was, and I was able to find my own voice without any concern about other people's input. Mm. That's an interesting kind of freedom to have, to, to develop. Um, and you've also spoken about your career as, um, in terms of um, concerning your career as uh, the blessing of a slow burn. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? What I mean by that is when my first novel was published, it wasn't published to much fanfare. I remember once I went to a writer's conference and the other writers who were all fancy were saying what they had worn to a, meet, to a luncheon to meet the media. And I did not know that other people were out there meeting the media, let alone what they had worn. And I just cried because I thought I would never catch up. Mm -hmm. Most of them, I don't even know where they are now, but I slowly built in each book was more successful than the last. And so I had the pleasure of momentum and the pleasure of feeling like I had earned my place, mm. not that someone had given it to me at mm. a luncheon. Instantly. Well, yeah, beautiful. Um, I think, well, we could open the floor for questions if there are any. I don't know if there's a microphone. Yes, there is. Um, Would you be open to asking, uh, answering a few questions? Well, let's see if there are any. Um, any audience questions or online? Well, the, no problem. And then I have a final question. So I noticed that, yeah, you know, people are just stunned. Um, that the dedication in your book is actually um, analogous to the one in Toni Morrison's Beloved, you know, um, where she has the 60 million and more, you have 29 and more. And, you know, I've, I've read that you love Morrison, and um, now I, it's the time where I have to plug uh, this festival's event series in honor of Toni Morrison, which has started today right now and is continuing tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, how else has Morrison influenced this book and your writing? Toni Morrison was such um, an influence on American letters, but also world literature. But one of the things that she did was, one, she was proudly rigorous. When I was writing um, Leaving Atlanta, you know, it has the different points of view. It's kind of nonlinear. But Morrison kind of made it okay, not, not only okay, but even celebrated for black writers to write things that are complex. She yes. debunked the idea that for a black story to be authentic, it must be vernacular or it must be extremely accessible. She made it clear that this intensity, this rigor is a type of blackness, not in opposition mm -hmm. to blackness. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was so important in my understanding of the ways that one could tell a black story. Mm. Yes, thank you for this. I think, um, yeah, uh, all I have to say is thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Uh, and I believe there's one other event um, that we can witness you at this festival. So, yeah, check it out. <laughs> thank you so much. And, yes, thank you all for being here. Thank you. This has been amazing. Thank you so much.